Welcome to the Vet Dental Show. I'm Brett Beckman, board certified veterinary dentist, and we bring this podcast to you every Wednesday as a veterinarian, as a technician, as a dentistry team to help you be even better at veterinary dentistry in your practice. We're sponsored and partnered today with the Veterinary Dental Practitioner Program. If you're interested in being among the best anywhere in general practice as a team in veterinary dentistry, I invite you to request an invitation. Just go to ivdi.org slash inv, like invitation, first three letters, inv, so ivdi. International Veterinary Dentistry Institute, ivdi.org slash INV, and we'll get you the information that you need. So, Kevin, what is the maximum pocket depth that you would try, try to restore with a bone graft? And this is the last question I will do on this topic, and then we'll move to tooth resorption. So, uh, looking at this, you see the attached gingiva is all the way up to the mucogingival junction. You have pocket depth anywhere from a couple of millimeters that if it bleeds when you put a periodontal probe in there, it's abnormal, all the way up to close to the mucogingival junction. You can do root planting and curatage, and you can clean those out, uh, but that would not be with a bone graft. <clears throat> this is basic perio. This is much more applicable to the general practice. You should be probing all of these teeth, looking for pockets that bleed, if they bleed, subgingival curatage and root planing. And many of you may not be doing this. We have people that come to our live wet labs and half of the people or more in the room don't know what this is. And this is what prevents your bone loss before it gets to be bone loss, where you can see it like this on that previous case. So if you are doing a bone graft, Kevin, you're not doing this but you certainly could do this. I would extract that tooth as well because this relationship is what caused that. You're going to see it back here very often as well. So you extract that tooth and or that tooth where the bone loss is. Furcation, forget it. That's, that's too hard to grow bone in there. Uh, you saw in this case we did, but it's very difficult to do that. Advanced procedure and a referral. So looking at, at this, these you can do. Subgingival curatage, you can open that up a little bit with a flap, not big, but just get enough exposure where you can see it, clean it out with a periodontal curette, and then either leave a blood clot in there, or in this case, I would definitely put a, a little bone graft, uh, sprinkle some console in there, put a little doxy robe over the top, plus or minus, and then close it. You know, I hope that answered that question. How often should be re rechecking cats with tooth resorption? How can we increase compliance even for once yearly or every six months? So those are great questions. As far as tooth resorption in cats, we know that from a source not to be revealed that we can induce uh, or we can place silk sutures around the neck of a tooth in a cat and in six weeks induce tooth resorption. So that alone suggest that there is some benefit or possibly some benefit in eliminating the periodontal potential for plaque accumulation and gum inflammation. That's not necessarily something that we can do effectively in cats. We can recommend home care in the form of healthy mouth. We can do TD. Uh, we can do other diets. We can do some chews. We can do um, we can't do brushing. Cats are not going to take brushing for the most part. Some would, but not not in the most part. It's not practical for 99% of the owners. So um, if you can eliminate some of the perio, get them in once a year, clean teeth, radiograph rechecks, <clears throat> I would say uh, every 18 months to two years. So if you're cleaning these uh, and they don't require cleaning, but once every 18 months or so, which some cats are fine with, then eight, every 18 months to two years 
is when you want to repeat those radiographs and catch some of these tooth resorption lesions early. So hope that answered your question, Megan. And Paula, are the extruding canine teeth that are being replaced by bone painful for the cat? And we can imagine that extrusion and that bone is certainly inflamed in the infected tissues adjacent to the bone where the bone is actually pushing away from the tooth and pushing the tooth out. So all of that tissue within that area where the bone's lost, especially if it's progressed, every time that cat moves against that canine tooth with a lip during chewing or otherwise grooming, whatever it might be, it's moving, uh, micro-moving that tooth and it's touching that bone, it's touching that tissue which is inflamed. So we can imagine it's probably uncomfortable. It may not be outright painful, but it can certainly be uncomfortable. And we've had patients that come in that are observably at home showing signs where they're pawing or they're maybe bruxing and there's a sound when they are not eating uh, that is associated with that extrusion and vestibular bone expansion of that tooth and it can also get to the point where it is impinging on the gingiva either upper or lower. So that extrusion causes that tooth to lengthen in relation to the bone and so it becomes a, a dagger and can sometimes cause problems. So uh, in those cases, yes, uh, it would be painful. Any tips in recommending tooth resorption at the gum line? <clears throat> Struggle in my oral exam and determination uh, to uh, catch a small pit with the tooth with, I would assume, the dental explorer. And is tooth resorption pretty obvious? It can be subtle. It can be really subtle in response to that question. And at at the gum line is where you catch those a lot of times. Canine teeth, they always happen at the apex first and work their way toward the crown. <clears throat> and so you, you can catch those radiographically. And at the end stage, you can catch them at the gum line. Very infrequently will you see anything at the gum line where you don't have severe resorption already uh, for the root. <clears throat> but with the treatment for, or the recognition of those, uh, the big thing is that you want to make sure that you've got good magnification and good lighting. And I have looked forever for something for our students for not only recommendations in practice, but also in our labs. And six years ago, I went to the Hinman Dental Meeting in Atlanta and paid what you guys would pay and what I would pay just to go to a whole FX meeting or NAVC meeting or Western Veterinary Conference meeting just to go to the exhibit hall. I spent all day there looking at loops, trying to find a loop that was good, that was a flip up, that we could use not only for dentistry, but also for general practice that had the good ergonomics where you would have a working length that was maybe 15 inches to 22 inches, not the up close jeweler's loop that's present in every veterinary practice in the world probably that is just a magnifier with a focal distance about that far which is being down on top of the patient not good for your back your neck your ergonomics uh, going forward and not good magnification uh, it also obscures your lighting if you're that close so you want something that you can use that's adjustable that other people in the practice might use you also want something that approximates uh, custom loops, and this is the loop that is very affordable. It's super good. The optics are amazing, and we've been using this for years. Just this year, with a small, very minimal price increase, they've upped the technology to make the, the focal distance greater. So. The, the problem with loops is a lot of times you're, you're confined to moving your head back and forth just a small distance and then it goes out of focus. That's a, lot, that's a big part of the reason why people get dizzy with loops. You cannot do dentistry without good loops. And those loops that you buy in an exhibit hall in veterinary practices are as good as those gray loops only they let you sit back a little further. They're terrible. So don't waste three, four hundred dollars on those or whatever the, the price is for those. You'll be super disappointed. These 
our bigger field of view. So instead of seeing a little bit, you see a much bigger, with, especially with their new technology. And also you get more range where you can go back and forth looking through the loops and your suture and the gingiva and your extraction site don't go out of focus. I, we, we love these. We use these in our practice. We use these for all the students in all of our wet labs. So I can't speak highly, more highly of these. I've looked for years and finally found the solution about six years ago. And the upgrade that they just did is amazing. So hopefully that answers your question there. When extracting type 2, how do you know if you've removed enough of the root from Carol? So this will go back to this image. This is a good image for demonstration purposes. This is that same cat with tooth resorption. And if you look on the left, the right again is perio. The one on the left is tooth resorption. You've got type 2 uh, resorption where you've got bone replacing tooth root on the distal root and very deep into the crown. Do you have any tips for suturing gingival tissue when it's friable? And that's that's another really good question. Gingiva tears easily, and Kim has a similar question. You have to use the right suture, and you have to be very delicate when you're doing your closure. You want to make sure that you've freshened the edges as much as possible and still be able to close. So you take a a um, scissor and you recontour that margin to remove as much of the inflamed tissue as you can without compromising your tension-free closure. And then make sure that that's straight both lingually and on the vestibular side or palatal and the vestibular side, depending if you're on the mandible or maxilla re respectively. And then that allows you to close and maybe eliminate some of that friable tissue but not always can you do that. So if, if you have a 5 aught cutting, which is a reverse cutting needle, <laughs> that is a P3 needle and using 5 aught monocryl, you will not have as much of a problem as you've described. And you can likely eliminate that in most cases. I hope you enjoyed that episode. If you'd like more information about the Veterinary Dental Practitioners Program, please submit to request an invitation at ivdi.org slash inv.